All right. So, uh, yeah, the title of my talk is obviously Validate Your MVP on Paper. And I found it a little disconcerting that um, a few people said that you know, they didn't really want to get out of the building in order to figure out whether their uh, MVP or their prototype was actually going to be adopted by customers. I think it's actually a terrible idea. And uh, the reason I think that is because if you don't go out and talk to customers or if you don't go out and even just get the ideas out there, then you're pretty much operating within your own assumptions. And as you know, Jonathan mentioned, it's always good to get some validation from outside people. You don't just want to think that what you think is right. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to definitely emphasize that as much as possible, you want to build a prototype. And I personally, despite being an engineer, love to build things on paper. So just to give you a little background, I know Nadia already went over it, but uh, yeah, was one of the founding engineers of Mint and then started BusyBee. And basically at BusyBee, what we do is we offer a membership management product and we focus on small businesses, specifically yoga studios. And then aside from BusyBee, um, I write on femengineer.com, which is a blog, but it's also in the last year turned into a little bit more of an educational outlet. So I do a lot of workshops and courses on startup methodologies in SF as well as remotely. So if any of you are interested in learning more, getting in depth into lean product development or other aspects of building a startup like technical recruiting, interviewing skills, you can check it out. So uh, what I want to talk about in today's talk is basically starting with the assumption that you, know, you want to build a product and you're not sure if it's going to succeed or not. But there are ways in which you can guarantee the success. And too often people complain that you know, their product failed because of resources or because the idea wasn't good enough or the customers didn't gain you know, traction or whatever. There's a million excuses you can come up with. But there's really just two reasons why an MVP fails, and I'll talk about those. And then in order to prevent this failure from happening, I'm going to give you a couple <coughs> tools as well as methodologies that I think you can use that are going to help you basically get your MVP to succeed. And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is how do you actually go about picking features for a, pro a prototype? I know this is one of the hardest challenges that people have because they want to get something out there. Many times they want people to pay for the product, but they're just not sure what features are actually going to be adopted. And like we've mentioned before, customers are always going to want everything. So how do you build over time that are going to attract more and more people? But at least how do you get that first prototype out there that people are going to say, OK, this makes sense. Hey, I'll give you a dollar or however much it is you want. Um, and the second thing we'll talk about is obviously paper prototyping. How do you actually do it? And also how it's going to get you to actually build a solid product when you do out, go out and actually build the thing on production. And then we'll talk about usability testing. I can't um, agree more with Jonathan when he talks about getting out there, getting more customers. You're always going to want to do usability testing. And I think too many people shirk away from usability testing because they think, well, we'll just let the data speak for itself. But truthfully, there's a lot of companies out there that still go out and actively talk to customers, actively um, look at their customers and their behavior. Steve Jobs is obviously one example, like Jonathan mentioned. But even Lululemon today doesn't just rely on data. They actually go and look at each individual store. They watch how women try on their sweatshirts and their yoga pants. And so it's interesting to see that despite all the metrics being out there, people still want to see how humans interact with products, whether they're a physical product or they're a you know, technical product. So two reasons why MVPs fail. Um, a few months ago, I wrote an article on two reasons why MVPs fail. It's on my blog. And also, um, these slides are on SlideShare slash v. So if you guys want to follow along, you can do that. So the problem that most people encounter is they always jump into building. And I find that this is so funny when I talk to a number of founders, whether they're business founders or technical founders. I don't know why. Everyone just loves to start building things. And I know you get that instant gratification. You get to play with the product. It's exciting. But then if you do this, you actually end up backing yourself up into a hole. Because now you've got to write tests. You've got to make sure that you know later on, you've accumulated all this technical debt. And then you know so, so on and so forth. You've got to build a production. You know, why bother? Or worse case, what a lot of business founders do is they put in a ton of cash and build a prototype. Maybe they go to a design consulting firm or product consulting firm and have the thing built only to figure out that nobody cares about it. So basically, their MVP fails. And the first reason is because they basically didn't bother to figure out what the value proposition was for the product. 
So that's the first thing you've got to do. You need to have a simple value proposition that differentiates your product from your competitors. It doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to build 10 different features, right? You just have to have one thing that's going to separate yourself from the competition. And the reason you want to do that is because that's actually going to then establish in the minds of a potential user or an early adopter why it is your product should be even used or tried out as opposed to a competitor's. The second is the reason people fail is because they just haven't identified who their early adopter is. So to give you a simple example, at BusyBee, when we started, uh, I always thought our product was for yoga studio owners. And so I went out there and talked to probably 50 or 100 different yoga studio owners and got a lot of rejections. And I found out the reason I was getting rejected is because we had a very subsect of yoga studio owners who were actually interested in our product. And that happened to be the studio owners who were sole proprietors or had independent studios, not the ones that had franchises. So in doing customer interviews, I then exposed that there was an even more niche market segment that we had to go after for our early adopters. So now if you want to attract more early adopters to your product or if you just want to get the, get the you know, conversation going, the first thing you want to do is you actually want to identify and research products uh, that are out there, who are your key competitors. Now I'm not saying to do this because you want to get obsessed with your competitor and all the different features that they offer, but just to get a pulse on why it is someone would spend money. When I did this, I uncovered that you know our big competitor, everybody hated the product, but damn it, they were making $50 million a year, so clearly they were doing something right. So when I went and did a little bit more research, I found out that yeah, they were the only player in the market, so they clearly had that first mover advantage, and there were some key components to their product that despite everything else that sucked about it, people absolutely need it. And so doing that research helped me to decide how it is I needed to differentiate my value proposition and my customer base from my competitors. Then the second thing I did is I went out and interviewed everybody, not everybody, but a vast majority of people that were using my competitors' product. Now the reason I did this is because I wanted to get a sense of could I compel them to switch over or could I possibly build something that was a point tool instead of the entire solution? So I wanted to look at different approaches to see what it would take to get these people to just hand over one dollar or at least five to ten minutes to try my product uh, instead of the one that they were using. So that's another key thing that you want to do is you want to go out there and don't just think you can't get these people. It might take a while for you to attract them and, and get them to switch over, but you at least want to get a sense of what are the must-haves in order to get them to switch. And then the third thing is to interview the people who aren't using the competitor's product. Now, this is something that's really important because you want to actually see what else are they using. Are they using Excel spreadsheets? Are they gluing together a number of different solutions? You know, what are they doing today to get the job done? And from there, what's interesting is you can actually consider that to be part of your MVP where you can do a lot of automation. So that's a way to, to expose some of how people are, or your potential customers are solving the problems today. So, now you want to kind of get into the heart of the discussion, right? You've, you've kind of isolated your early adopters, you have a sense of who they might be, but you want to actually go out and find them, right? So we want to get out of the building. I know that people care about speed, but truthfully, you're only going to be as fast as you can collect feedback and you can collect it from a majority of people. So schedule an interview, it doesn't have to be long, 15 to 20 minutes, but I, I like to get out there and at least talk to about 50 to 100 people um, just to get a sense of what their needs are. Remember, you want to build for the general case. And then get them to actually test your product, get them to commit, right? Now, the other thing that you want to talk about when you're having these interviews is, you know, what are all their problems? And the reason I say that is because too often people just limit themselves to thinking, well, I'm building a prototype, so we don't need to know everything. But you do. You need to be able to anticipate maybe changing features or building a product roadmap for later on. So don't limit yourself to just what you think the MVP should be. And then the other reason I say that is because, you know, you want to figure out what problems might be caused by your competitors and what problems they might just have themselves. Uh, whether it's a B2B tool or even a consumer product, this always applies. And then figure out, like I said, what are they using today to solve their problems? Right? Are they using a solution already? Are they kind of cobbling it together? Or what's, what's making them unhappy? Get at the emotional play, like ploy. Make sure that you, you address that and then get them to un get, give you a lot of that feedback. And then 
finally, figure out what they can't live without, right? Whether it's their Excel spreadsheet or whether it's their existing product, you know, what's the particular feature or what's the one thing that they absolutely need to have that isn't going to get them to budge? And if you can do that, then you'll have a better sense of whether you want to you know, refine that particular type of feature or you want to include that or you know, where it is it's going to come in your roadmap. Like I said before, it's always important to keep in track of the competition. And uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of different competitors. People are going to crop up over time. But the bigger thing is, um, you know, how are they solving the problem today? Right? So, and, and don't just think about this as how are they solving the problem like from their product perspective, but look at the entire spectrum. Right? Think about the most basic cases of their customer support, the experience of the initial sign up flow. There's a lot of different parts that people get frustrated with. So take all of that into consideration when you're building your prototype. And then what problems are they creating, right? Are they, I know with our competitor, um, they've got about a two week trial period or um, period where they've got to train everyone, which is frustrating for, for a lot of yoga studios. They don't want to sit there and train to learn how to use a product, right? They just want to be up and running. So figure out what the other problems are. And then, you know, why is it that they are absolutely loved or why is it that they're hated? And even play to that, right? If you know that people hate your competitor for certain reasons, you can, you can use that in your marketing material. You can use that to get more adopters. So what I like to emphasize is that early adopters are people who aren't using your competitor's solution. You don't want to spend your time trying to switch people over or convince them to pay for a product that they don't want or they're not ready for. Focus on the folks that aren't using a solution at all today. So this is a really hard problem, right? Picking features for an MVP, and you're not going to get it right. What I'm trying to give you is some tools and methodologies to kind of help you get, the, get it right, or at least think about how you should approach the features. So the first is take the feedback that you get from the interviews, right? Put them into user stories. I know one of the questions that was asked earlier was, well, what if you take the feedback and then you don't do anything with it? Well, like I said before, you want to take general feedback, right? Yes, there might be one person who wants you to make the application pink and everyone else thinks it should be blue. You know, go with the blue. But don't try to, don't try to over-engineer and design for all sorts of corner cases, right? Think about how to build for the general case. That's what the MVP is about. And then think about how to create a simple paper prototype based on how your product is different from the competitor, right? Are you simpler? Are you a point tool instead of being an end-to-end -end system? What is it that you're offering in that initial prototype? Now, I know this can be a little bit difficult because, like I said, you've got to do a little bit of market research. You've got to look at your competitors. But keep in mind, if you expose the pains or if you at least get a sense of what's the initial experience you want to give or what's that initial feature set, is it going to solve a pain or is it going to in improve their experience, that's what you want to put as your feature. So let's talk about usability testing before we talk about how to do paper prototypes. And the reason I kind of um, change the order is because I think a lot of people don't really understand how to do a usability test. And you know, they all think you just get out there and you talk to a customer and you put a piece of paper in front of them and then they tell you stuff. Well, there's actually a bit of a warm up period. And the reason I say that is because everybody's busy. People don't necessarily want to sit there and give you 15 minutes of their time, especially for B2B products. And I know somebody asked that. Truthfully, nobody, whether it's consumer internet or B2B, everybody's a little reluctant. So the, the key thing is to do a little bit of a sales pitch, right? And that's why I said if you can get at what the problems your competitor is causing or why people might hate them, then you can say things like, well, you know, we're offering a new solution, just looking to get some feedback. If you've got 15 minutes, I know you hate X, Y, and Z product. You know, we're offering a simpler solution. Can I get some of your time to show you our prototype? People are a lot more willing and, and wanting to see what you've got. So explain what the product is that you're offering. And then tell them what it is that you're going to test. Tell them, look, just going to give you a piece of paper, and collect some feedback. It's not going to be any you know, grade. And then explain to them how they're helping you, right? These are, these are people that are going to be potential early adopters, potentially even paying you for building a solution. So get them invested in the idea and get them excited about the idea. And then set the expectations. 
what's going to be involved? A lot of people, um, for some reason, when you do usability testing, they actually feel like it's a real test. And so to get them interested, um, like I said, just make it very simple. You know, don't have to make it out to be this hour-long session. Um, just explain what's going to happen and make sure that they're comfortable. And then internally, figure out what it is you're testing, right? Do you have certain metrics? Are you just testing a particular workflow? Or do you care about um, a particular feature that you're putting out? Make sure you know what it is, the feedback that you want to collect from them, and, and make sure that those points are addressed. And then I know you can't see these last two, but you know, obviously thank them for their time. And follow up, right? Show them a low fidelity. Show them like a piece of paper, um, like Jonathan said, with just Sharpies. And then tell them that you're going to come back maybe a couple weeks later or a day later or however long and show them a high fidelity. And then, of course, a final prototype where they can actually play with it. So, so give them that transition so that they get a sense. And once again, they get invested in the idea and the concept. Sorry, you can't really see this, I realize now. But this is just an early example of um, a prototype I built, a paper prototype I built for BusyBee. And you know, I, I did this in Balsamic, but like I said, you can do this just on paper using a Sharpie. It doesn't have to be very highfalutin. The thing I like about Balsamic is you can start off and you can make it look like really a piece of paper, and then you can actually design some interactions into it. So if you want to do a second pass where people want to click, they can do that. Um, the other reason that I like using this sort of stuff is uh, because you can rearrange elements using balsamic. So, you know, what I like to do in the first iteration is not have any color, just black and white, and get a sense of is everything on here make sense? Is there workflow issues? Uh, is there a copy that doesn't make sense instead of making it a high fidelity and then people fixate on like, well, why is it blue or why is it pink? You're like, no, I just want to know if you know, what's out here makes sense. This is especially important when you're building a workflow tool um, as opposed to maybe like a consumer internet social application. And, and the reason is because people get confused by data, right? So, so that's a reason that you want to get a sense of, you know, is the data on here make sense? Does the copy make sense? Because people are using this for their livelihood. So tips to do things very quickly. I know Jonathan talked about uh, Verify. Another example is user testing. So if you're a large organization or you know you're going to do consumer internet, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know you were going to talk about Verify. Um, but yeah, feel free to check out Verify as well. I'll do a plug for both. Uh, so you know, use a service like user testing. I'd actually suggest doing this as early as possible um, because the great new, great thing about a service like this is they pull from a lot of different customers or a lot of different people. So you get some good feedback, and getting that feedback early on helps you to iterate. And then, like I said, always keep people in the loop, right? Even if there is a particular set of customers that are like, oh, we're not going to use this product until you build X, Y, and Z feature. Great, you know, just keep feeding them new features, new information, and then once you get ready to build that XYZ feature that they want, then say, hey, look, I'm going to send you some sketches, or I'd like to set up 15 minutes to get some feedback. And, and you'll notice that people um, will be interested. So don't wait till it's too late, you know, launch the thing and then collect the feedback. Um, the reason I say that is, you know, at my first startup, Mint, um, the first thing that we launched was just, a way to aggregate all of your bank account and your credit card statements. And that was it. So you saw all your transactions. But people obviously complain. They're like, what about my student loans? What about my investments? Yeah, OK, we'll, we'll keep launching new stuff, right? But this is the MVP. And so all we wanted validation on was, you know, are people capable of getting their uh, bank information downloaded? And are their transactions categorized? And that pretty much was like 50% of what people wanted. Um, truthfully, I think the product has been a little bloated over the years. And a lot of people go back and say, well, they're just happy when it was alerts and bank statements and credit cards. And that's all they wanted. So a lot of times, simplicity actually wins. So just to recap, the two reasons why fa uh, MVPs fail. Well, the first is that people just jump into building, right? They don't take the time to actually get a sense of, what it is that they're building, how are they going to be different in the market. And then the second is they don't identify who their early adopter is. They just sort of assume, instead of getting out there and talking and trying to segment the market. And then in picking out features for your MVP, you really want to expose the pains, or at least figure out how it is you're going to give them a better experience. 
And then we talked about paper prototyping. I mentioned, you know, just get something very simple, lo-fi, and use that to start conversations. And when you're doing the conversations, make sure people are comfortable, they want to give you their time, and get them invested in your idea so that they're always there as you continue to iterate. Because like Jonathan said, you know, you always want to iterate on these things. And that's actually the beauty of paper prototyping is you can do quick iterations. You're not limited like you would be if you jumped into building. So in case you're, uh, no, I'm out of time, but uh, I hold office hours on Thursdays and Fridays at 2 p.m., so about an hour. So if you want any one-on-one -on -one time to talk about your product, I'm available. Do I do Q&A? I have a question. How do you convince 100 uh, yoga teachers to talk with you? <laughs> well, um, Twitter. And uh, it wasn't like I sat down and did like 100 and, you know, you know spiel. Um, it was a little bit more of, well, here's one, and then here's two, three, four, five. So I did it over a six month period. Um, I basically spent six months doing customer development because, truthfully, I never owned a yoga studio. I'd you know, worked at one, and I had volunteered and done all this stuff, but I wanted to get a sense of what it was like. What, what did you offer them in exchange? The fact that there was a crappy product on the market that they were very unhappy with, and we were going to be a simple alternative. So you will get the free version when it's released? No, they weren't going to get a free version. Um, they were actually going to pay for the product. Yeah, so I was, I was very strict about, you know, you can try this out. It's going to be a two-week trial. Um, we want you to, you know, help us. And that was enough of, of an interest um, to get them to bite because they were just, and they still are, incredibly unhappy with the comp competition. So that's why I say it's important to get a competitive landscape and how people feel about the product because it can actually help you to attract early adopters. Sure. Uh, do you have any philosophies around, based on how you compare to other products, how you price things, especially like when you're talking to someone, <laughs> if you're going to be charging them, but you don't know how much you're going to charge them, things like that. How do you, how do you kind of communicate that? Yeah, so in the, in the early phases, I always like to just put a price. Uh, and the way that I did it initially is I, I did a bit of a competitive landscape. So I looked at what our competitors were charging. And then I knew like we were a really basic product when we came out three years ago. We just you took attendance and did a few things. So the way I thought about it um, was I want to price it under the, the competitor because it is a new product, right? But I'm going to slowly start you know, adding as we add features. Um, so just kind of putting a stake in the ground. And truthfully, what I did is I went and talked to about five different folks. And I said, how do you feel about $27? And they were like, yeah, it seems reasonable. And then you know, the next batch, I'd be like, how do you feel about 57 And then they were like, eh, I don't know. But then it was interesting to see kind of how people reacted. right? Some people were like, oh, sure, I'll pay 57 So that's how we kind of inched our pricing. When I bumped it to 87 Nobody was happy with it. So we kind of knew that our price point hovers around 57 for the feature set that we have today. Um, and, a, and a lot of that is actually phone conversations. Um, it's not looking at what people click on, because people always click on like the free trial or the free package, because they want to get a sense of what that is. So the um, one thing I like to do is I just like to send people invoices and, uh, and see how they react. And, <laughs> Um, you know, it's just through PayPal. I don't have their credit card. And like, they get pissy, but then they're like, oh, well, she didn't ask me for my credit card. And then I say, yeah, so are you going to pay for the product or what? And they're like, no, we're happy. And then I get, I get to collect a little bit more feedback.